Welcome back to Biology. I am Mr. Kabuski. Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to keep working with Unit 4. Yesterday we talked about cell membranes and why, how they allow certain materials to pass through them and why uh, small cells are more efficient than larger ones. Uh, today we're going to talk about the processes behind actual movement of those uh, materials in and out. So Unit 4, Section 2. Uh, it's called Passive Transport. Before we talk about that, uh, I kind of want to give you a couple of questions to ponder. Okay, think about these questions. I'll throw them up there. What happens to your cereal if you leave it sit too long in milk? Oh my gosh, drive me crazy. I'm going to pour me a new bowl because that stuff gets all soggy. And number two, have you ever had that sucker and you put it in the side of your mouth and you leave it there for a while like if you're talking to somebody then you go to move it and then the inside of your cheek feels all dry? Okay, uh, if I sprinkle sugar onto my strawberries when I finish eating my strawberries at the bottom I always have that juicy uh, pink like sugary stuff left behind. Uh, okay, if some someone passes gas in the room, especially in the classroom. Trust me, I realize it, kids. I don't know if you guys do or not, okay, but I realize it, okay, because it spreads throughout the room. So I usually spray, uh, and that also will spread throughout the room. Now, what do all these situations have in common? Well, they all have something to do with one, something moving, okay, either from... Um, from one area to another, okay? That's basically what it means, okay? This is known as passive transport, which we're going to talk about today, okay? Passive transport, what is that, okay? Well, it means the particles move from areas where there are several of them to areas where there are few, okay? In my example here, okay, I've got my left side here, which is at, at the beginning, and not right now, obviously, because I'm trying to talk about it. In the beginning, has several of these little purple dots on the left side, and then over time, they spread to where, an area where there are a few, and then by the end, they're spread evenly throughout the whole thing. Okay? This is known as moving from high concentration to low concentration. High concentration because there were more purple guys on the left side than the right side in the beginning. Okay? This is known as moving down the concentration gradient, going from high to low, so I go down the gradient. And a concentration gradient just means the difference in the amount of substances across the space, left side to right side in this case. Okay? So, question for you. Does this process require energy? Did I need to do anything special to start these things uh, on their merry way? No, they, I don't. Okay? Let me give you another example. Okay? So, I've got my semi-truck here. Okay? Uh, <laughs> let's say he's going to go from high concentration or the top of a hill to low concentration of dirt, which is the bottom of the hill. Okay? Let's honk the horn. Where's my horn? I got no horn. Try that again. There's my horn. So I got my semi, he's rolling along, he comes to the top of a hill. Now, let's think about it. To get to the bottom of a hill, is he going to have to use lots of gas or a little bit of gas? Okay. Well, he's a truck, so in order to get started, he's going to have to use some gas. But once he gets rolling down that hill, he didn't have to use much gas at all. Okay. Because he could just let gravity do the work for him because he was going from high to low. Okay. This obviously is not diffusion or passive transport, but it kind of illustrates our point because we're going from high to low without using energy. Okay. So passive transport is movement across a cell membrane that requires no energy from the cell. That's why it's passive. You don't have to do anything to get it to work. Substances move down a gradient from high to low, and that will continue until we reach equilibrium, which means that the smell of your air freshener or the water in your cell, whatever, is spread evenly throughout the entire space. This is why when you spray an air freshener right at the beginning, it's always really strong and concentrated in your area, but then over time, the smell isn't as strong because it's being spread throughout the entire room. It isn't that it's leaving or that it's gone, it's just that it's now more spread out and that therefore uh, the, the scent isn't going to be as strong as when they were all compact together. Okay? Think about it like in a car would be another example. Okay? As if you put a new air fresher in a car, you leave all the windows closed, okay? that, that smell is stuffed in there, it can't go anywhere, but if I open all the windows, that smell is going to be gone, so it's not going to smell as strong inside the car again. Uh, equilibrium is just when the amount of substance is equally distributed throughout the space. Examples would be Kool-Aid and Febreze uh, because they don't require any energy other than to start the process uh, because these are man-made things. Okay, so a couple of examples of passive transport. Here I have my orange solute. Okay, they're going to, to diffuse in water. Obviously my high concentration is left, low concentration is right, so they will move until they evenly spread. Another example would be if I have two solutions or two solutes I have the purples on the left, oranges on the right. So both sides are high concentration, but of different things. So they will spread evenly until they're evenly distributed amongst one another. Okay. Now there's three types of passive transport, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is the simple one. It's just a simple idea that we move from high to low concentration until we reach equilibrium. It could be anything. 
Uh, it could be, like we said, all the different things we've talked about today. Uh, perfume is a good example. That's the reason that they put perfume in the front of department stores facing out towards the mall. It's because that smell will diffuse out into the mall and cause customers to go, oh, that smells good. What's that? And they want to go buy that perfume. Okay, I know uh, your Hollister stores that you guys like to go to, they do that a ton too. Uh, they actually purposefully do that, and that way that smell permeates out and uh, and leaves and, and go reaches you through diffusion out in the mall and want to go buy things from that store because it smells good. Okay, uh, Facilitated diffusion. Facilitate just means to help along. So this is diffusion of large particles through a transport protein. This is why we had to talk about the cell membrane yesterday. We had to talk about uh, what a transport protein is. So you can see my two examples here. Here's my pink cell. Here's a purple cell. They both. This one has a black uh, transport protein. This one has yellow. But both of them are allowing things. This one's allowing things to move out. This one's allowing things to move in. And then the last one is osmosis. That's just diffusion with water. Uh, usually it has something to do with water and a solute. So in my example here, on the left side, I have high amounts of water, which is the little blue and white balls here. And then low solute, which is the green dots here. It would be like salt or something like that. Okay. On the opposite side, I have a lot of salt, but not a lot of water. So my water is going to move from left to right. Okay. And then my solute is going to move from right to left. Okay. They should move at the same time and move evenly until they're evenly distributed. In cells, in your cell membranes, we have something called aquaporons, uh, which is a type of facilitated diffusion. They're a type of transport protein that actually allows the water to move back and forth across the membrane. Uh, there's lots of cool videos here. If you go, uh, if you download my PowerPoint and click on some of these, uh, there's some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I don't want to spend a ton of time uh, on them. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe five time at the end. We'll see how much time is left. Uh, I'll show you a couple of those. So here's uh, illustrated examples of all of those things. Diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. You'll notice osmosis, there's some pictures of some red blood cells here that have changed shape. That's because they're in different types of solutions. So there's different directions that osmosis can occur. Okay, Let's look at my example here. On the right, inside my cell here, which is the yellow area, I have lots of blue dots. But on the outside, I only have two blue dots. So which way are my blue dots going to move? Well, they're going to want to move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. So that means this solution that it's in, this white area, is known as hypertonic because there's more solute outside but more water inside. So the water will move out and cause the cell membrane, or excuse me, the cell to actually shrink. Okay? So the water moves out and the cell shrinks. The opposite then is called hypotonic. In a hypotonic solution, there's more water outside the cell, so it's going to move inside passively, okay, where solute will move out. And then that means that the cell will actually grow in shape. Okay? It will swell. And actually, if it swells too much, if water kept moving across, uh, it could actually cause the swell to burst. That's called lysis. Here's an example of a cell that has burst. You can see its cytoplasm is now being spread through an area. So here was the cell. You can kind of see his cell membrane here. He has popped. Uh, he got too big and he popped. And now he has lost his cell membrane and lost his cytoplasm. The last one then, if it's even on both sides, you can see I have the same number of blue dots and green dots on either side. That's known as isotonic. Water will still move in and out. Okay, it doesn't ever stop moving. Okay, but it moves equally, so it's already in equilibrium. So the cell will just stay the same shape. Okay. Uh, cell walls. The reason the plants have cell walls is to prevent that bursting from happening. So you can see. Here's a plant cell. It has the same amount as the, as the animal cell, but because it has the cell wall, it kept it from bursting. And then lastly, some organisms don't want to have a lot of water inside them, so they have something called a contractile vacuole, which will fill with water and then will pump the water out. Think of like a fisherman in a boat that's got water coming in. He keeps those buckets, and he keeps sending them over the side. This little single-celled organism is doing the same thing. It's allowing that vacuole to fill with water, and then it's squeezing it to flush all the water out. But then it has to keep doing that over and over and over again. So that's what a contractile vacuole is. Okay. Now, do me a favor. Go back through your notes. I want you to highlight each of these words. Make sure you know the definitions for each of them. Okay. These are going to be important words. I'm not going to ask you to write definitions. We just did that in the notes. But you need to know where to find the words when you go back to look at your notes later on. Okay. Now, hopefully you learned something today. If you have questions, you can see my contact information down here. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about active transport when we actually use energy to transport materials. So I look forward to talking to you then. Have a great day.